I want to share with you one of my favorite words, one of my favorite English words. The word is dapple, D-A-P-P-L-E. Dapple means splodgy. Splodgy means if you've got a dark color in an irregular shape on a paler background. A dappled horse, some of you may know, is a pale colored horse with dark splodges on it. Dapple is the essence of beauty. Anybody who was tortured learning English literature at school may remember a beautiful poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins called Pied Beauty. It's a gorgeous poem. You should try reading it. And what it's all about, it's a hymn in praise of Dapple. He talks about how splodges make beauty. And he talks about the skin of a trout swimming under the water. He talks about the play of light and shadow through the leaves of a tree on a sunny day what the Italian masters used to call chiaroscuro, dark, light, light, dark. Imagine what dapple is. Imagine what pied beauty is. It's about taking contrasting things and messing them up. And that's what real beauty is. That's where it really comes from. And I think there's more to this than just beauty. There's more to this than just aesthetics, because this is also a powerful, profound secret of the universe that messing things up is cool. It's what makes things really work beautifully well. Messing up ideas is a good thing to do as well, and that's where creativity comes from. Creativity is a word that we often throw around, and we don't think very hard what it means. <laughs> I have a simple definition of creative. For me, creative is the opposite of boring. It's as simple as that. <laughs> and boring is pure, and pure is boring. Adolf Hitler was a fool. Adolf Hitler was a guy who believed that if you get uh, blonde-haired, blue-eyed people, blue-haired, blonde-eyed, I can't remember, blue-haired, blonde-eyed people to make babies together, you'd end up with a master race. Master race, my foot. Anybody who's studied biology for more than 15 minutes knows that if you narrow the gene pool and you get similar people to make babies together, in a very short time, you'll get a bunch of weird-looking goofs who can't even count up to three. <laughs> and on the other hand, if you do the opposite and you mix stuff up, then you know, as I myself have personally discovered, your offspring get quickly more beautiful, more gorgeous, and more brilliant with every generation that passes. So that's good. <laughs> and possibly the wisest words ever spoken on this subject were spoken by one of the wisest men who ever lived, a man named Bob Marley. Bob Marley, himself a dappled man, and his unforgettable quotation on this very point, it fills my eyes with tears every time I remember it. You've got to stir it up. <laughs> so stirring it up is the essence, not just of beauty, as I said before, but it's also the essence of the solutions to the problems that we need to find in the modern age. How am I going to pull that one off? Well, I'm going to start getting serious at this point. The last time I spoke on a TED stage, in Berlin in June, I talked about the idea of the good country, and I launched the Good Country Index. Very briefly, what all that was about was the idea that we live in an age of globalization, where everything is connected and everything's mixed up, but at the moment, at this point in time, it looks to me as if globalization has done more for the problems than it has for the solutions. Any gigantic global challenge you can think of, whether it's human rights, or human trafficking, or drug trafficking, or slavery, or pandemics, all of them have been worsened by globalization because they're connected everywhere. And they've now got to the stage where individual nations can no longer solve them individually. So my argument in Berlin was we've got to start competing a bit more, a bit less, I'm so sorry, and collaborating a bit more, because nation states were created in competition with each other. They were created to fight. And there are two forces pulling in opposite directions, I explained. On the one hand, you have the global problems, which are the out of the reach of any nation, and we desperately need cooperation to fix them. On the other hand, you have nations competing against each other as if it was still the 18th century. And this has got to change. And I introduced the idea of the good country. Good is not a moral judgment. Good is the opposite of selfish. A good country is a country that doesn't just worry about its own citizens and its own problems. It it pursues what I call the dual mandate. The single mandate, 
Politicians are only responsible for their own people and their own slice of the planet. This is the way it's always been, but that's got to change. In the next few years, two years, five years, as soon as possible, we need politicians, and not just politicians, anybody in a position of power and responsibility to adopt the dual mandate. And the dual mandate means that anybody in a position of power has two sets of responsibilities. They're responsible for their own people and for every single human being on the face of the earth. They're responsible for their own slice of territory and for the entire terrestrial globe. Now, a lot of people, when I say that to them, they say, but that's really difficult. And I say, yeah, <laughs> it's really difficult. When people say to you, but that's really difficult, there are two things you can say. You can do what I do and say, yeah, it's really difficult. That's kind of why I want to try. And you can also do the other thing I sometimes do, which is to say, oh, shit, you're right. It's really difficult. <laughs> OK, I'd better give up. Thanks. <laughs> you can try that. It's sometimes quite disarming to people when you do that. Anyway, here's the thing. You're right, it is really difficult, but I think it's possible because we're talking about wide-scale cultural change. I don't mean, of course, that every politician in the world will think that the rest of humanity is more important than his or her citizens. That wouldn't be right. They wouldn't be doing their job if they thought it that way. But what I'm saying is the dual mandate means that at some point in the near future, I hope in the near future, it will become impossible for anybody in a position of power or authority to discuss anything without considering the international consequences of what they're discussing or planning to do. We can't even decide we shouldn't be able to even have a conversation about changing the light bulbs in our hospitals without thinking about the impact of that on the rest of the world and on the rest of the planet, because if we don't do that, truly we're going to be in trouble. So that's globalization. Now, it's easy to talk in a gloomy way about globalization, and I just did, there you go. It's easy to fall into that trap. What I wanted to do today, and the reason why I mentioned DAPL, is to remind you, and I hope it will stay with you, of the beauty and the power and the wonder of globalization. Because truly, globalization is the problem, but truly globalization is the solution. Because all of this technological change, all of these extraordinary communications, what's it done for us? It's put the power of global culture at the fingers' ends of anybody who cares to use it. It's put an instrument of awesome, creative and innovative power at our fingertips. And we mustn't ever forget that. And we mustn't ever forget to rejoice in that. That's where the solutions are and the creativity that comes from stirring it up. I remember years ago, I used to work in what we call the creative industries. And I had a company that was responsible for coming up for creative, with creative ideas occasionally. And I had 45 employees from 39 countries. We had a fantastic time. But the one thing that was interesting was that we didn't find it difficult to come up with creative ideas. There's a sort of myth in the creative industries that coming up with ideas is incredibly difficult. And you get a small number of very serious creative people, and you give them drugs and alcohol, and you lock them in a room for 24 hours, and at the end of it, they come out with one idea, which is, OK, and they think it's really good. And then everybody fights about it. And this never happened to us. We found that we only needed coffee to start with. And secondly, after about half an hour, we had 300 ideas. We had more ideas than we knew what to do with. And it was simply because we were mixing up the cultures. If you get people who come from the same cultural background to come up with ideas together, it's very, very difficult indeed. And people sometimes say, well, what about the language problem? How do you even understand each other half the time? And actually, it was the language problem that sometimes produced the ideas. I remember one particular occasion, we were having an argument about football, as you do. And um, my uh, Brazilian creative guy was getting very, very agitated about it because the conversation had taken a turn he wasn't very happy with. And um, my Dutch employee, who, like all Dutch people, spoke beautiful colloquial English, said to him, Enrique, don't get your knickers in a twist. <laughs> OK? <laughs> now, I don't know if you know that expression. It's kind of a cliche in British English. But my Italian guy had never heard this before. And he looked at me across the table and he said, what's he saying? <laughs> so I, I explained it to him and, and, and I translated it. I said, it. I said, it means, non farti attorcigliare le mutande. Do not make that your knickers are twisted. <laughs> right? And at this point, uh, Francesco collapsed in hysterics. And uh, he said it was the funniest thing he'd ever heard in the whole of his life. And he still uses it today in situations where perhaps he really shouldn't. But there you go. 
that's what happens. You misunderstand people, and you're stirring it up, and you're mashing and messing things up, and it produces ideas. You don't have to take my word for this. Okay? I've come up with a little something that will enable you to try this for yourselves. Not now. I'm not going to embarrass you. Uh, it's called mini worlds. Okay? A mini world is a very simple thing. Next time you've got a challenge or a problem in your life, it could be something very small, like what am I going to buy my mother for her birthday? Yeah? Don't ring your sister. Okay, don't ring somebody from your own culture, because the chances of them having a solution to your problem, which is different from the sort of thing you would pick up, are very, very slight indeed, because you eat the same breakfast cereal, you're made of the same DNA, it's pretty unlikely. Instead, have a look on your social media, look at your network, see how many people you've got who are from other countries, other cultures, and do a deal with them. Say, I've got a little problem, I want your help. You pick the five people or the ten people, hundred people, lucky you, from different countries, and you say, if you help me to come up with some ideas for this problem, I'll do the same for you next time. And I guarantee... No. <laughs> I think it's very... I don't want to get into legal problems here with anybody. I, I, <laughs> this is not a legal guarantee in the legal sense of the term. I, I promise, I think it's extremely likely that you will find that you will come up with a, a bunch of amazing ideas. And you'll also find that because it's so fun and so easy, you may start just looking a bit more at your networks and seeing how many people you've got from different cultures there and how useful they can be. And you may even find that you start to value more and more the people who come from weird, exotic places just because of what they could bring to the party. That's what I've done for years. And you may even get to the stage where you enjoy doing this so much and it works so well for you that you end up with a complete mini-world. Last time I checked, it was 196 countries on Earth. If you make a mini world with 196 friends from 196 countries, two things will happen. The first thing is, uh, you'll call me and I'll buy you dinner. Promise. Guarantee. <laughs> the second thing is, you may well find that that resource that you've managed to accumulate of 196 different nations is actually a bit too powerful uh, for deciding on birthday presents for your mother. You might think that it would be more useful uh, to try and solve climate change or poverty or something of that sort. So I think that Mini Worlds is just one of a million different ways that you could tackle this problem. And I think it's quite a cool way of doing it. So try it and see if you enjoy it. But the purpose of all of this, ultimately, is just to remind you of a few simple points. Believe Bob Marley. He knew what he was talking about. Trust the power of DAPL to solve problems. Trust the good side of globalization. And there's another thing that I wanted to tell you about. How do you feel? Do you feel more part of the world than of your own country? Do you feel that humanity is more important than your nation? Are you slightly sickened by narrow-minded nationalism? Do you want to be part of the world, and do you want to mix those colors and those cultures together and produce something amazing and start solving some problems? Yeah? You are not alone. Done some research. It appears that about 10% of the world's population feels exactly like us. Conservative estimate, that's 700 million people. 700 million people around the world who are naturally cosmopolitan, who are global citizens, who really, really want to do something to produce some change and don't want to be alone any longer. So today, right now, TEDx Amsterdam, I'm really, really pleased to be able to announce the launch of the Good Country Party. Okay? So very briefly, the Good Country Party is this. It's a non-political non-party. It can't be a political party because it's not based in any country. It's based in the spaces between countries because it doesn't represent any individual nation. I wanted to get it legally registered on the International Space Station, but that proved to be quite problematic, and I wasn't able to pull it off before today. But who knows, I might be able to do that. What it is, it's a place where those 700 million people and many, many more behind them can gather together and talk and discuss and make and create and learn. It's open right now. All you have to do is join. It costs nothing. I promise I will never, ever ask anybody for anything. I don't want to collect signatures. I don't want to do petitions. I don't want to harass politicians. I certainly don't want donations. I just want you, the 700 million people, so we can get together and start talking about how we're going to change the world. www.goodcountry.org. Join now. When there are 700 million of us, they'll know about it. Thank you so much.